All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to uh, hope to give you a little bit of uh, maybe some illumination and at least my perspective uh, on what we uh, have seen as a rapid increase in uh, the description of lots of new mouse lemur species. Um, before I do that, I want to make sure that I uh, get a special acknowledgement in here right away. And maybe she'll lift her head up from her desk. But um, the Duke Lemur Center uh, was, uh, was an important uh, component in my, in my research uh, trajectory because it's what, in large part, brought uh, Dr. Ann Yoder back to Duke here. Uh, and I was lucky enough to get hired on as a postdoc by Ann um, shortly after she arrived here at Duke. And uh, Ann's been a really influential uh, part of my career. She's been a wonderful scientist and collaborator, a fabulous mentor, uh, and also somebody who's really sort of emphasized the importance about having fun uh, in science. And so uh, I just want to give a, a very special thanks to, to Anne for, uh, for helping me develop as a scientist and, uh, and for doing the amazing work that she's done here at the Lemur Center. Okay, so I'm going to assume that most everybody out there is aware that there's um, a really crazy amount of species diversity now uh, within the genus Microcebus. Um, in just a little about the last 20 years, species diversity has risen from two named taxa uh, to up to now 24 described species of mouse lemur. And, uh, you know, if we uh, think about some of the basic morphs, we have things like the gray mouse lemur and the red mouse lemur, which have been around for a long time. Um, and then uh, early on, descriptions uh, began to pop up based on things that had pretty clear morphological differences. So here's Microcebus ravilabensis, which is one of them. And uh, this uh, rapid increase in uh, species diversity um, is sort of a unique aspect. Well, I, sh I should say it's not a unique aspect uh, within lemurs, but it's definitely uh, for the genus Microcebus. Um, this is the genus that receives the most attention when we think about rapid increases in species diversity. And so, um, so what underlies this? Well, um, definitely across the mouse lemurs, we see some really clear differences in a variety of traits. Some of these earliest species descriptions uh, were based on clear patterns and differences in morphology, ecology, and other traits. And so again, coming back to this example of the comparison between murinus and Ravilobensis, um, there were some very clear differences that really seemed to highlight that these things were separate evolutionary lineages, often living in sympatry. But really, the burst of species discovery and description has been um, based on insights that we've gleaned from molecular data. So uh, as we began to sort of move into the molecular world uh, in, uh, in mouse lemur, um, studies, we began to uncover lots of patterns in, uh, in genetic diversity that were used to describe a wide range of species. And um, this uh, sort of great diversity that we see now really would not have been uh, a, a something that we, would have, um, we wouldn't have described as many species without access to molecular data. And this is particularly true for species that are uh, distributed allopatrically. So, so again, some of the earliest descriptions um, we're focused on differences between uh, uh, species that lived in sympatry with each other, but the real um, uh, explosion in species discovery and description has been based on species that are distributed, distributed um, allopatrically across the island. And uh, once we, we do know that once we actually discover these genetic differences and that we see that populations are genetically differentiated from one another, that's when studies are then able to go in and find um, differences morphologically. These are typically slight. They tend to be differences, uh, small differences in size, in uh, pelage coloration. Uh, but it's not until we use this genetic data that we're actually able to identify some of these differences. Um, so uh, if, we if we ask what is sort of the genetic variation that's, uh, that's been used to describe species, Mitochondrial DNA has really uh, been sort of like the workhorse. It's played sort of the largest role in the discovery and the diagnosis of uh, mouse lemur species. And so this is just a couple uh, of examples um, that, uh, that have uh, described species based upon mitochondrial sequence data. And the general gist of it is that uh, as new populations are discovered, 
as samples are brought in, they're sequenced for uh, different regions of their mitochondrial DNA. These are put into a phylogenetic framework. And when new clades uh, pop out that are genetically distinct from previously uh, identified clades, these represent new candidate species. And so mitochondrial DNA has been um, sort of the, really, the real uh, major molecule that we use to identify uh, genetic differences. And then it's worthwhile just to point out that these studies have sort of were, have, uh, been incorporated across lots of different research groups. Different research groups have used different regions of the mitochondrial DNA, and that's kind of hampered our ability to actually make sort of complete comparisons across the entire clade of mouse lemurs. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. All right, so mitochondrial DNA has been a major uh, influence in the discovery of uh, these new mouse lemur species. So maybe not surprisingly then, uh, there have been um, some skepticism. A, num a wide range of skepticism has uh, developed as a result of this massive number of new species. And uh, this is just an example of a couple sort of uh, prominent papers that came out over the last 10 years questioning whether or not these mitochondrially based species descriptions really represent true underlying species diversity. And the, uh, the messages that, uh, that are sort of uh, within these two different uh, papers that I've highlighted here can kind of be broken down into a few sort of more particular uh, um, descriptions. And so... Is it back there? All right. So the, the first sort of knock on the use of mitochondrial DNA as a, as a measure of species uh, divergence is that the mitochondrial DNA represents a very limited subset of the genome. And so mitochondrial DNA itself is its own genome within, uh, within the cell, and it represents just one measure of uh, the evolutionary process that has affected the entire genome. So the genome itself, the sort of total genome, uh, is comprised of many, many thousands of blocks of nucleotides, these that are separated by recombination events, and each one of these individual units within the genome is its own record of the evolutionary history of a set of populations. And I use this, uh, this, oops, this figure right here to kind of sort of emphasize this. So this is an example from, uh, from the primate uh, literature, and what you're seeing here are just a couple examples. Here's human chromosome 1 and human chromosome 2. And what they're showing you is that if you look across the chromosome and you look at different loci or regions of the chromosome, they tell you different stories about the underlying evolutionary history. So these little red bars down here represent genes or regions of the genome that consider humans and chimps, can't see it, to have the closest common ancestor. And then these blue and green bars across the top are genes that represent uh, regions of the genome that say that, for example, humans and gorillas have the cl our closest common ancestor, or the green line where chimps and gorillas share our closest common ancestor. And the point of this right here is just to sort of emphasize that depending on which region of the genome you choose to study, you may get a very different uh, perspective about the evolutionary history uh, of that region. And so evolutionary processes that are recorded in the mitochondrial genome may not actually be reflective of the broader overall genome. And so, for example, uh, if we want to ask how much gene flow occurs between populations, if we only look at the mitochondrial genome, we're not going to really have a true estimate or, or a more uh, accurate understanding of how populations are connected. Another knock against mitochondrial DNA is that, uh, and this is um, uh, more of a technical issue, is that some of the studies that have used mitochondrial DNA have used studies and analyses that are not really appropriate for the data. And so here we have a situation where some species have been uh, described based upon genetic distances. So if a new population is discovered and their mitochondrial DNA is sequenced and they form a distinct clade, if that clade has a certain threshold of evolutionary distance from other clades, then that would warrant species uh, description. And so this can lead potentially to the oversplitting of populations into unique species. Um, if you look across lemurs, uh, these estimates of mitochondrial DNA-based genetic distances at the intra- and interspecific level often overlap. So we really just don't know what the actual good threshold of species-level uh, divergence uh, should be if we're using uh, a single locus. 
And then finally, from a technical perspective, uh, authors have pointed out, this is work coming out of Peter Kapler's group showing that individual sampling itself may be insufficient to accurately identify diagnostic, tra diagnostic traits between species if you're using mitochondrial DNA. So if you don't sample enough individuals, you may not know whether or not populations really do share variation or whether or not they're fully distinct. And then finally, uh, maybe one of the more general uh, and fundamental knocks against simply using mitochondrial DNA uh, to describe species is that um, lemur system systematists have lost sight of what exactly a species is, all right? And so this is, uh, I think, basically the message that came out of the Tattersall paper in 2007. And what, uh, what they're basically, or what Tattersall was basically saying here is that uh, what we're really just doing by describing all of these species of mouse lemur is that we're just kind of carving up genetically differentiated populations and we're not really diagnosing actual diverging lineages. And so uh, new, these newer approaches to species delimitation have shifted away from uh, the, a focus on reproductive isolation. Uh, and when, you, when you're using measures of reproductive isolation, these are the criteria that are gonna more likely identify species where there's no longer gonna be gene flow and you're no longer gonna have reticulate evolution. Uh, and so um, this is sort of, I, I thought this was one of the nice uh, little lines from this paper, and that's that our current perspective on mouse lemur species is that we're basically carving up uh, this genus into lots of little packages that are untidy in their nature. Well, to kind of address these issues, uh, and this is work that I've been involved in over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, obviously one of the next steps then is to add in more sampling from the genome. So to move beyond just sampling mitochondrial DNA and to begin to look at genetic differentiation and divergence among populations, taking a multi-locus approach. And so we can do this by going out and sequencing different nuclear genes, this work came sort of before the genomics era, and so this, the, what I'm gonna be talking about here for the next set of slides is work based on a handful of nuclear loci, but, um, but I think they help illustrate the point. And so uh, what we did back uh, in about 2008, 2010 was began to sequence some of these nuclear genes, build gene trees in the same way that we would do for mitochondrial DNA analyses, and look to see whether or not we resolve concordant patterns of clades across populations. And what we find when we do this is that some species uh, consistently and concordantly are resolved as monophyletic units in different gene trees. And so here's an example, if you can't see down there, where species such as Microcebus, Microcebus ribolobensis, Microcebus tenosi, Microcebus simensi, all form monophyletic groups in nuclear gene trees, giving some measure of, uh, of support to the idea that these represent independently diverging units. But what we also have in these situations are lots of species that in their nuclear gene trees don't form monophyletic groups in the same way that we see in their mitochondrial DNA. And this includes some things that we would consider to be really, really robust species. So for example, Microcebus murinus and Microcebus grizia rufus here do not form reciprocally monophyletic clades in this particular gene tree. So taking this gene tree by gene tree approach is kind of a challenging and maybe inappropriate way to think about addressing whether or not uh, nuclear data really do support uh, this high level of species diversity that we see. Well, one of the next steps that we took with this work was to take some of these nuclear loci and to say, well, instead of asking whether or not we're seeing reciprocally monophyletic clades in these gene trees, can we take some other analytical approaches to just simply ask whether or not we see uh, cl clusters of individuals uh, based upon their allele frequency patterns. And so this is just what we would call a nuclear assignment plot, uh, which you maybe can't see that there's individual ver vertical bars here or horizontal bars going across here that represent individuals. And if an individual is assigned to a particular genetic cluster with really strong support, it's whole horizontal bars, all one color. And so for example, you can see here that Microcebus simensi, all individuals are all assigned to this one genetic cluster, and that's concordant with a mitochondrial clade here. And so we can take this approach and we can look to see whether or not our nuclear data really do support uh, the level of genetic diversity and species diversity that we see uh, with mitochondrial DNA. And maybe what was surprising for, for me when we did this work was that we actually see that yes, for the most part, 
a lot of these mitochondrial clades that we resolve that look to be really distinct truly do match up to these really distinct genetic clusters by these nuclear, nuclear assignment tests. But the problem here is that we're really just sort of still searching for patterns here, and we're not really asking questions about process in the identification of species. And so really we're just kind of take, still to continue to take this sort of subjective measure of whether or not these represent species or not. And so that leads us to um, sort of, I think, what is some of the more recent work that we've done with this group. And that's to begin to take this multi-locus approach and actually place it in a hypothesis testing framework. And we can do that by using models of species divergence and putting our data in there to ask whether or not our data support a splitting model where, say, populations have split from a common ancestor, or whether or not those data better support a model where we lump all those things together into a single species. So what we're doing here is we're actively using a, a, an approach to test for divergence of species. We do this using um, some various types of statistical modeling. And I'm not going to go into the details on there, but we use what is known as the coalescent model. And the coalescent model is a very simplified way of using expectations based on genetic drift to ask what the probability is that, uh, that genes are either all going to coalesce within a single species or whether or not genes are going to represent coalescence to a common ancestor between species. And then we can use some uh, different types of, um, of analytical approaches to test these models. Again, I'm not going to go into the details. These are Bayesian methods. In one of them, we can uh, assess the posterior probability of these two models to ask whether or not we see significant support for one over the other. Uh, and in this case, what we would come up with is uh, a measure or a posterior probability. So in this example, if we had a strong posterior probability for this splitting model, we would, uh, we would infer that we are detecting a history of lineage divergence between these things. The other method that we can use uh, is uh, another Bayesian method that calculates what we call the marginal likelihoods of our data under these two things. And again, I'm not going to try expect you to work with the details here except to say we're just going to focus on these things called Bayes factors that we can use to compare the likelihood of one model over another. And when we use these Bayes factors, they tell us something about the strength of support of one model versus another. So for example, if uh, we detected a Bayes factor of about 25 for the lumping model, we would say this is really strongly supported uh, over the splitting model. And generally, when we, when we interpret these Bayes factors, and I'll just make sure I emphasize this because it'll be important a bit, a base factor is greater than 10, mean really, really strong support. They call it decisive support for one model over another. So what does this allow us to do? It allows us to extend our sort of pattern-based processes where we're going in and looking for the discovery of genetically differentiated groups. So we can, say, look for things where we have evidence of genetic differentiation between two sets of populations. And we can then place that in this sort of lineage splitting or lineage lumping model-based framework. And we can then test, do these two different genetic clusters represent two different species, or do they represent a single species? And I could just kind of, I grab these pictures here, these outgroup species, because I, I don't know why, but I thought that that guy looked kind of scared that maybe, uh, maybe like his brothers are going to get split, and then this mouse lemur looks pretty happy that everybody's staying within one species. Uh, that's why I thought about it. So, um, so what, do, so what do we do? Okay, so I'm not going to bore you guys with all of the tests that we did. I'm just going to give you a few examples to kind of highlight how we, we take this approach towards species delimitation. Um, and so the first thing that we can do is we can look at uh, a set of species that I think maybe we'd all be very comfortable with agreeing that they are good species, right? So here we have Microcebus uh, birthae, Microcebus rufus, and Microcebus myoxenus. Okay, these things have been described for a while now. And when you look at their mitochondrial DNA gene tree, they form these uh, fairly distinct clusters, although there's a little slop there with this thing right here. And then we take nuclear data, and when we actually ask, okay, what levels of population genetic differentiation do we see? We see that these things kind of carve up into these different clusters. So this light blue here is birthday. This like mostly orange group here is rufus. And then this sort of like blue and green combination here is microcebus myoxenus. So they look like these different species can be assigned to different separate genetic clusters. 
So if we go ahead and we take this then and we say, okay, now let's apply our model-based framework to test whether or not these really do have a history of lineage divergence, this is what we see. So if we take a model where we place birthday and Rufus as sister species and we split them, and then if we take the alternative model and we lump them together in a single thing, we see a really strong posterior probability for birthday and Rufus being separate species. And I'm not gonna show you all the combinations, but we've tested all the pairwise possibilities here. And the bottom line is from this approach, strong, strong support that these three species represent very, very distinct evolutionary lineages with a history of divergence. If we calculate marginal likelihoods for this group, we come up with a Bayes factor for the splitting model of 86.8. This is a really, really huge difference, okay? So the, this, this nuclear approach, this coalescent-based model testing approach, strongly supports the idea that these things are, are separate species. Okay, so maybe that's not all that surprising, right? So, well, well then let's test uh, maybe one of the newer species hypotheses that are out there. So in some of our, our mitochondrial work, um, that we had done uh, in some of some our earlier papers, uh, we saw that uh, if you looked at Microceba simmonsi and you looked at population or individuals that were also sampled from this island population, this is uh, Ile Saint Marie or Nosy Baraja, uh, what we found is that uh, the island population always formed a mitochondrial clade distinct from the mainland population. If you turn around and do uh, these nuclear assignment-based tests on these, we again see that these things separate out into very clearly distinct genetic clusters. Uh, so are these species? Well, if we apply our model testing framework to this, here's what we see. The splitting model receives a posterior probability of one and a Bayes factor of 26.7 over the lumping model here. So here again, we seem to find Strong, strong support for this idea that you know mitochondrial DNA, nuclear data are all concordant with each other in supporting a history of lineage divergence. And in fact, we described a species um, based upon this work. This is now Microcebus baraha. So um, we're part of the problem, I guess. But I believe now that we actually have like really good data and really good objective approaches to uh, to actually testing these types of hypotheses. Now, the, uh, the sort of counter to this might be that these coalescent-based analyses may be prone to oversplitting species. And so um, here's an example from Microcebus grizia rufus. So if you look at grizia rufus population sampled from the southern uh, portion of Madagascar, uh, one of the populations, um, Beza mahakali, which itself is a very unique population, um, forms a mitochondrial clade that's distinct within the larger grizia rufus clade. All right, so if you look at the mitochondrial DNA, uh, the Beza population is distinct from everything else. And if you do nuclear assignment tests on this, what we find is that that Beza population forms a really, really distinct genetic cluster from the rest of these Grizzly rufus populations. And so, does that mean that the Beza population is a distinct species? Well, if you apply this lineage, uh, uh, lineage divergence framework using this model testing approach, we find a fairly weak support for a model that supports speciation between these two sets of populations. And in fact, the Bayes factor for this is very, very mild. So the marginal likelihood of this model has a Bayes factor of only 1.3 over the other model, which basically is saying it's insignificant. So here we have a situation where we still detect, we detect mitochondrial divergence, we detect patterns of genetic differentiation in their nuclear DNA, and yet this model testing framework says there is no history of lineage divergence between here. So I use this as a counter to kind of show that, you know, just because we can collect data and apply these tests doesn't mean that we're gonna go out and describe every species as a new taxon. All right, so are we confident then in our overall current appraisal of mouse lemur species diversity? Well, uh, ideally, studies of species uh, and species divergence would be coupled with both molecular data and a wide range of other biologically relevant information. And robust diagnoses of these mouse lemur species out there that use this approach has really only been demonstrated in a rather small number of species relative to the overall species diversity. And so again, for example, if you look at Murinus versus Ravalobensis, we see very strong differences, everything from feeding ecology to habitat preferences. And so we have examples within the literature of really great integrative ap approaches to describing new species. 
And in fact, there's some really fabulous data out there that has come out of Elke Zimmerman's lab. This is a paper by Braun et al. showing that uh, there are actually, there's evidence among mouse lemur species for divergence in acoustic signaling. So we have potential evidence for prezygotic isolating barriers between species. But again, this is only available for a, a small number of species. And achieving this level of knowledge and evidence for species diversity or the lack of speciation and species diversity among, uh, across the range of microcebus um, is really going to take probably a long time. And, and to, to collect this level of information for all species that have been described um, may not be very likely. And so this is where I, I make the case that multi-locus genetic data may really provide sort of our best source of evidence for delimiting the true level of mouse lemur species diversity within Madagascar. And so coalescence-based delimitation, as I just showed you, uh, it's based on a direct assessment of lineage divergence. So we're testing for the signal of divergence from a con common ancestor in our data. And really, this is uh, sort of secondarily tied to, sorry, didn't mean to go too far there. This is secondarily tied to the effects of gene flow between populations. So if populations are connected by sufficient levels of gene flow, we do not expect to detect that signal of lineage divergence within our data. And so in this sense, uh, species hypotheses supported by coalescent-based tests are in some way meeting the criteria of biological species concepts. So we are actually testing for the presence or the absence of gene flow and connectivity between populations. All right. Um, Uh, and then finally, uh, sort of the last thing that I'd want to sort of, the last plug that I would put in here for using these delimitations methods is that they really do provide sort of the first uh, approach towards developing a common framework for studying species diversity uh, across the genus. And then finally, um, I would just sort of say, you know, if we want to ask, you know, are there really 24 species of mouse lemurs out there? And I think, um, the perspective I would put on that is then that what do we want our species to be? And what do we want species diversity to be within this island? And I was trying to come up with a, a good figure to use for this, and I couldn't find one. So the other night, I just hand drew one in Illustrator. And so, uh, so what I'm kind of giving you here is sort of like you know, a hypothetical example of you know, how speciation really works. And we know it's messy, and we know it's dirty, and we know that over time, we may have divergence events between things that then come back into contact later on. We have extinction events where species blink out over time. And then we probably have lots of things where there's sort of very, very new and recent uh, species at the tips of this overall species. And so if, you know, if the overall goal is to have really clean and tidy lineages that you know, inexorably move into the future without any possibility for reticulate evolution, then you know, maybe we're not willing to accept this type of stuff right here, right? Maybe we're only looking for these really, really long branches here, right? However, and this is sort of the approach that I take, you know, if we really want to understand the history of lineage splitting, the history of divergence within this system, that in many ways that means that we have to pay attention to what's going on at these more recent time scales. And so with that, I think I'm going to run out of time and I'm going to jump forward. Uh, and skip over a few slides here. And, uh, and I will thank uh, the many people that have been really helpful with all of this work. Uh, I've had an opportunity to work with a, a number of groups, both with, uh, within the US here, within Germany, within Madagascar. Um, so thanks to them. I want to especially thank NSF for funding for this work uh, and associated work over the years. And with that, uh, I'll take questions if there's time.